Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Our Heavenly Father, we are gathered here today in recognition and celebration of our graduation. We thank you for the blessings and help we have received. Your help has made our presence here possible. We are grateful for the freedom we enjoy. It makes it possible to choose the direction of our futures and to pursue our dreams. We ask that you bless all those gathered here tonight, that these proceedings will be conducted in a manner pleasing to you, and that we will be safe from harm and accident. Also, we ask that you continue to bless and guide us so that our futures will be fulfilling and that our efforts will benefit not only ourselves, but that we may have a wide-reaching impact on many people. Help us to be open to future opportunities to learn. Help us to remember what we have learned and to share that knowledge with others whenever possible. We ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're met here this evening to honor the 1986 graduating class from Utah Technical College at Salt Lake. I want to extend my welcome to you graduates, to your parents and family and friends, our special guests, the faculty and staff of the college, and all others who have joined us for this commencement exercise. To begin with, I would like to introduce our platform guest to you. To my right, the Honorable Norman Bangader, Governor of the State of Utah. Dr. Rolf Kerr, Commissioner, Utah Commissioner of Higher Education. <laughs> Wayne Owens, Vice Chairman of the Board of Regents. <laughs> Glenn Stringham, a member of the Board of Regents. and President Emeritus J. Nelson. <laughs> to my left, Dr. Joanne Burnside, Chairperson of the Institutional Council. <laughs> Ruth Hardy Funk, member of the State Board of Education. Gary Carpenter, student body president. I can't pronounce your name here, but I know you as Mimi, so I'll introduce you as that. Mimi Lowe, student speaker. Janet Sharp, student. Gary Rice, student. and Joyce Ryan, a student. <laughs> On the back row, beginning at my far right, S Susan Bogenreef, a member of the Institutional Council. <laughs> Dwayne Johnson, a member of the Institutional Council. <laughs> Jeanette Kendrick, a member of the Institutional Council. Mike Boley, a member of the Institutional Council. <laughs> Arnold Christensen, a recipient of the Honorary Doctorate. <laughs> Dr. Richard Lindsay, 
a recipient of the honorary doctorate. <laughs> Dr. Max Lowe, Vice President for Instruction. <laughs> Jim Schnurl, Vice President for Administration. <laughs> Dr. Michael Homer, Dean of the School of Business and Industry. Jeffrey Brueger, Dean of the School of Continuing Education. <laughs> Ann Erickson, Dean of the, of the School of Technology and General Education. <laughs> Lou Ann Paulson, Dean of the Skill Center. <laughs> and Loretta Walker, a member of the faculty. A graduation exercise is both an ending and a commencement. It's a time to reflect and a time to look ahead. It's a time to think about the role and the importance of education as students, as teachers, as administrators, and as those who decide what share of state dollars can be spent for education. In these times of scarce dollars, and short timelines, it is ever more necessary to place a value on education. It is not uncommon for young people as they reach their middle teens to question the value of education. They sometimes think that teachers are teaching things that have little use in their life. Most of us have asked the question of what value is education? Most tech college students have already determined that education is vitally important to them before they enrolled in the first class at the college. Formal education speeds the learning process. The School of Hard Knocks is a thorough teacher, but it takes a lot longer to learn in that school. A wise physician once said, the best way to learn to be a doctor is not to go out and have all the diseases yourself, but to benefit from the experiences of others who have. Civilization progresses little when each of us spends our time reinventing the wheel by ourselves. In the early days on this planet Earth, it took hundreds and perhaps thousands of years for our collective knowledge to double. Since that time, we have decreased, we have increased the speed at which we acquire knowledge. At the beginning of this century, collective knowledge was calculated to have doubled in a hundred years. In the early 1970s, collective knowledge was doubling every 10 years. Recently, scientists have estimated that the world's collective knowledge is doubling now every 18 months. It is projected that knowledge will continue to double or increase faster in the future. What a challenge to mankind. How can we expect to keep abreast of changes coming at that rate? Planning for today and tomorrow must take place almost simultaneously. Education is now a continuous career-long process. We have a continuing education. We have heard of continuing education or lifelong learning options for years. Today, it's not an option, but a necessity. We must learn more in less time just to keep up. If we take as long as we traditionally have to gain our initial education, we may find that we're preparing for a what we're preparing for is outdated by new technology, as far advanced from what we have studied as the pencil is from the computer. If our economy is to survive intact, if Utah is to remain competitive in national and world economies, if the quality of life for Utahns is to continue to improve, we must begin today. No, we must have begun yesterday to improve our plans for how we dispense and acquire education. Education is the cornerstone of civilization as we know it, the most basic building block in our economy. Clark Kerr was correct while at Berkeley when he said that our civilization is in a race between education and chaos. The need for quality education is not getting enough of our collective attention. 
We're fortunate to have the faculty and the staff that we do at Utah Tech who are committed to meeting the changing needs for education and changing their delivery system and content fast enough that we are not teaching to obsolescence in this rapidly changing world. This college has come a long ways since it first opened in the mid-40s in a remodeled laundry building. That first year, there were 307 students in 16 programs. Today, there are 9,000 students in 60 programs. And tomorrow, relatively speaking, there may be 20,000 students in 100 or more programs. When the college first opened its door, it had 23 faculty members. Today, it has almost 200 full-time contracted faculty. And some quarters, there are 400 part-time or adjunct faculty. The first annual budget was $207,540. Today, the total annual budget is more than $25 million. I've been in the world of formal education almost all of my life. As a student, as a teacher, as an administrator, including four college presidencies over the past 17 years. My perspective, based on that experience, is that for education to keep pace with the challenges it faces, we must form strong partnerships. A major goal of mine has been and will continue to be building those strong partnerships with all who can help make our education programs succeed. Utah Tech has actively pursued, pursued partnerships with other Utah higher education institutions. We also firmly believe that partnerships with public education are as important as with higher education. We have a long history of partnerships with local school districts to make the transition for students from their educational programs to ours as easy as possible. The Tech College and the University of Utah have been most actively pursuing a partnership over the last three years. Many Utah Tech people meet often with many university people to assure that our educational programs, like our new Associate of Science degree programs, are compatible. As a result, students can transfer in both directions with very few problems. Similar agreements exist with Utah State University, Brigham Young University, Weber, and other four-year colleges. When the University of Utah implements its new entrance standards in the fall of 1987, any student not accepted will be immediately advised into identical lower division classes at Utah Tech. By joining hands in this partnership, the University of Utah and Utah Tech will jointly provide the most comprehensive educational opportunities available through such a single effort in the history of Utah. Other partnerships are being formed with area businesses. Currently, there are many businesses in the Salt Lake area participating in our cooperative education program where students work on the job to learn specific skills related directly to their college work. We have citizens advisory committees organized to advise us in each of our educational programs. These volunteers from local business and industry make sure that our educational programs match the training needs of their companies. Utah Tech currently has partnerships with numerous social agencies, helping the unemployed, the underemployed, the handicapped, those who must learn English, single mothers with children to raise, and other disadvantaged adults. I think often of Martin Luther King, and I can see him in my mind's eye standing at a pulpit or a podium with his fist in the air saying, I have a dream. I too have dreamt of where this college should be going. I read the statistics about the rap I read the statistics about the rapidly increasing number of people here in the Salt Lake Valley wanting to go to college. I read of the governors and others goals for economic development so that the young people need not go elsewhere to get good jobs and raise their families. I see so clearly the potential for this college the tremendous things it can do to help our community and our state. 
So I can truthfully say with Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Not only do I have a dream of it happening, but I have a vision of how it can happen and what it will look like when it does. Among all my great professional experiences, no other career experience compares, compares with what I see for this college, and never have I wanted more to be a part of such an exciting experience. I challenge each of you today. I challenge you graduates to keep abreast of change, change by making your education a lifelong process, by returning again and again to learn the last developments in your field. I challenge you faculty and staff to maintain the broad perspective, to realize more clearly how important your work is, to be forward-thinking, to prepare your students for change. I challenge our leaders of business and industry to become more involved with education than ever before, with dollars and guidance and influence in every way possible. I challenge the people of Utah to place education where it belongs on the list of social priorities, number one. I challenge the people of Utah to support education not only philosophically and emotionally, but financially, to produce the quantity and quality of education that we need. We must pay the price. We will reap what we sow. Thank you. On this night of awards, and as a member of the Institutional Council, it's my opportunity to give a special award to Arnold Christensen, whom I'd ask to come forward at this time. And if I may, at this time, I'll introduce him and give you some background on, on uh, Senator Christensen. Senator Christensen is the president of the Utah State Senate, and he serves on a number of boards and committees, committees in, in that uh, role as president of the Utah State Senate. Uh, he has national recognition as a member of the Executive Committee of the National Conference of State Legislatures and also serves on the Executive Committee of the Council of State Governments. Senator Christensen is a, an electrical contractor by profession, and in 1982 his peers, the Associated Builders and Contractors, gave him a special award in, in naming him the Legislator of the Year. Senator Christensen has a number of community and uh, religious activities that he has been and is involved with at the present time and in the past. He uh, is the father of four children, the youngest of which is graduating from high school tonight, and he asked if he could be excused after because the graduation ceremony is taking place at the same time. I assume that that's one of his highest uh, uh, goals and things that he's done in his life in, in regard to his family. He uh, has been heavily involved in the scouting program. He's a former LDS bishop and stake president. He's an Eagle Scout himself, as a matter of fact, and uh, at, this, at this time he's on the governing board of Cottonwood Hospital and on the advisory board of the, of the Utah Symphony. <clears throat> Senator Christensen has been a great friend of Utah Technical College in a number of ways. We can't get into the details tonight, but because of the, uh, the uh, things that he's done in, in the community and for on behalf of our college, it's my pleasure to represent the college and by authorization of the Utah State Board of Regents <clears throat> to award this evening to Senator Christensen the honorary degree of Doctor of Vocational Technology on this fifth day of June, 1986. Congratulations. Thank you. To Governor Bangader, Commissioner Kerr, President Carnahan, to the faculty, to you graduating students, to the audience this night, I express gratitude for the honor that has been bestowed upon me in receiving this award and accept it with great pleasure. I would like to also say to the graduating students this night, the information is given to the legislature as we deal with the budgets and where do we put money for education is that 80% of the jobs that are going to be available in Utah in the next 10 years will be made available to students who have received preparation at such an institution as this college gives to you. 
I see in the future a great role for these students, and for you particularly as graduating students this night, that society has a great need of you, and there's a great place for you to fulfill, and I'm confident that the training you've received tonight and in your college years prior to this will prepare you to meet those needs, and it will be a great contribution to society. Thank you. It is my privilege and a particularly pleasurable one for me to be able to present to you tonight Dr. Richard P. Lindsay, if you will join me here. I would like to tell you a few things about Dr. Lindsay. In fact, if I were to tell you all that is contained in his resume, we would probably be here until about 9.30 the night. So because it is so extensive, I have condensed it considerably. Suffice to say that Dr. Lindsay has had wide experience in administration and in working with people in several management positions. As managing director of public communications and special affairs for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he is in an admirable position to see what's going on in the lives of many people throughout the state. As a teacher of political science and of public administration courses, as well as professional service as Utah State Commissioner of Finance, the Executive Director of the Utah State Department of Social Services, and so on and so on, Dr. Lindsay knows the realities and intricacies of high-level finance, commerce, and government operations. His unique talents as a manager and as a counselor make him invaluable to this community. It is for these reasons, and many unstated, that it is my privilege as chairman of the Institutional Council of the Utah Technical College in Salt Lake to bestow upon Dr. Richard Powell Lindsay the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters awarded by this institution upon authorization of the Utah State Board of Regents. My privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Burnside, Governor Bangeter, and Commissioner Kerr, and President Carnahan, distinguished leaders and faculty, and some of you somewhat battered but uh, amazed students that you're here tonight. I think I can feel a little bit with you and for you as a great proponent of adult education who spent something like 20 years of my adult life with uh, six children and a loving wife that helped get me through these various chairs. I have some appreciation for what you've uh, accomplished. I admire those of you that I see in wheelchairs and who have paid a great price for what you have accomplished and what this night represents for you. And then I look at the companions, the spouses and the children in the uh, audience, and I say power to you as well. This is a great thing, and I think President Carnahan has given us a fine vision of where we must go with the vision and support of public education in this state. I've been a great cheerleader for the Technical College. I live on a ground which my grandfather homesteaded, which is adjacent to the college and which he removed the sagebrush from more than 100 years ago, and it was a little over 50 years ago that I started to thin sugar beets on that very same ground, and about 22 years ago, if President Nelson and I have it correct, that uh, we were there sitting on a board on inverted five-gallon cans as Governor George D. Clyde turned the first shovel of ground for this marvelous institution. And I've admired as I've heard the reports and have been uh, able to know a little bit of the progress, the new programs, the new buildings, and the great faculty and administrators of this institution, which are the heart and soul of it. What you take from here tonight is certainly more than your diploma. It's everything that you've internalized 
It's the education that I promise you will make your life richer. It'll be more than making a better living and making more money. That's an important part of education. But education is also the understanding and living of a better life. And for this, I salute you and congratulate you. And for Marion and myself, accept this award with great pride and honor for this institution. Thank you so very much. Once again, Utah Technical College Foundation has provided Teaching Excellence Awards for outstanding faculty. The purpose of these awards is to recognize, encourage, and reward excellence in teaching at Utah Technical College. Each award is given to a faculty member who clearly exemplifies outstanding teaching performance that in so honoring its own, the college may nurture, enhance, and promote the establishment of superior educational accomplishment. This year again, five recipients are to be recognized who in every way exemplify teaching excellence and who enhance and promote the establishment of superior educational accomplishments here at the college. This year, the Foundation Board has asked that if more than one faculty member is selected to receive the award, one of them be selected as the most outstanding. I have complied with their requests. As I call their names, will the recipients please come forward to receive this Teaching Excellence Award? Catherine Beebe. While she is coming up, let me call the second one. Ree Erickson. The next one is Jerry Giles. Let me say that Jerry has been selected among the five to receive the award as the most outstanding. Herb Van Oss. And number five, Loretta Walker. Oh, could I, excuse me, I forgot yes. one. Can I just stand sure. here right this minute? I knew I'd forget something. The, uh, in addition to these five Teaching Excellence Awards, again this year, a high school vocational teacher has been selected to receive a Vocational Teaching Excellence Award. Although I will not, although I will announce his name here, the award will be given to him at the annual State Vocational Conference next week. His name is C. Fred Tanner, Automotive Trades instructor at Brighton High School, Jordan School District. We're over here.
Fred's son is also graduating from high school tonight and has asked if he could be excused early enough to attend part of that ceremony. Thank you for being here, Fred. Thank you very much. Governor Bangerter, President Carnahan, honored guests, faculty, graduates. It is my great honor to direct these remarks, especially to you, the members of the graduating class. As this day approached, I was reminded of a story. A ship lost at sea for days signaled a passing vessel saying, water, we die of thirst. The friendly vessel answered at once, cast down your bucket where you are. The first ship signaled three more times and was answered in the same manner. At last, the captain of the distressed vessel, heeding the message, did cast down his bucket. And to his amazement, it came up filled with clear, sparkling water from the mouth of the Amazon River. He and his crew had been suffering from thirst for days when right at hand was boundless supply of water. Although you and I have completed our work and are about to begin a new and exciting life, there lurks in the background of our minds a doubt as to our ability to do all the noble things that are expected of us. Can we make the world any better for having lived in it? We have dared to dream, but will we dare to do? Not that we are unwilling. The trepidations we feel are there because we do not wish to disappoint or fail to live up to the expectations of our loved ones and friends, many of whom are among us today. To you graduates, I say, if the opportunity for which we are eagerly waiting fails to appear, let us cast down our buckets where we are and make use of the present opportunities. We can dignify labor and use our mental powers and ability in all the occupations of life, even the most common. We can seldom begin at the top, but must climb slowly and often laboriously from the starting point. To dream and then to do constitutes the field of life's endeavor. But we must remember that patience and perseverance are essential to attainment. I truly hope your experiences at UTC have been as worthwhile as mine have been. A great deal of learning has taken place. Hopefully, we will have the desire to continue learning the rest of our lives. But what is the distinction between learning and education? The two terms are frequently used as if, as if they were synonymous. However, there are vast differences between them. A man may know mathematics, philosophy, art, and literature, and be totally unable to cope with the problems that arise in life. He may be a slave to conditions and unable to master himself, not to mention others. He's learned, but certainly not educated. Another man may know little about those higher subjects, but he may have all his faculties and powers trained to their highest possible degree of efficiency. He may be absolute master of himself and of the environment which surrounds him. He is certainly not learned, but he is educated. Education is not book learning. It is much more than that. What is the level we have attained? One of the most important steps in the education and development of man is the ability to have convictions and the courage to stand by them. Let me share with you a few lines written by Emerson. I find them truthful and inspiring. I quote, It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of a crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. Unquote. Is that one of our goals? To know ourselves, to gain self-control, to stand on our own, to benefit others? The one great gift of education is that it gives us the torch of aspiration, the ambition to dream, to be, to do, the great incentive to progress, the will to continue the struggle, no matter how great the odds. There are many great qualities to be pursued. As we are about to enter officially our chosen fields, I would like to share with you three attributes which I consider refining tools in our education and essential to meaningful success in life. The first one is tolerance, the attempt to comprehend the beliefs of others and the motives governing their actions, freedom from condemnation of those who do not think or feel as we do, acceptance of those who are different. Edmund Burke, the British author, said, I quote, If I have more strength than my brother, 
it shall be employed to support, not to oppress his weakness. If I have more light, it shall be used to guide, not to dazzle him." Unquote. I feel one of the greatest examples of tolerance for humanity was a man who lived during this century. During his lifetime, he became one of the most famous men in the world, and yet he never sought fame or glory. Millions of people the world over knew his name and praised his work and ideals. He came in contact with relatively few during his life, yet he became a legend in his own time. He was Albert Schweitzer. He called his philosophy reverence for life. This is what he said. Reverence for life demands from all that they should sacrifice a portion of their own lives for others. The second quality we must have is that of enthusiasm. I can tell you a vivid description of what enthusiasm is. A woman shopper went into a meat market and ordered two pounds of hamburger. The clerk yelled at the butcher, two pounds of enthusiasm. Why do you call it enthusiasm? The shopper asked, and the clerk answered, because he puts everything he's got into it. <laughs> Giving it everything we've got, what a way to cure apathy and how much more of it we could use. Emerson said that nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. But it is among the Greeks that enthusiasm receives its noblest definition. It means God in us. The third quality I suggest we need is one that we graduates know about or we wouldn't be here. It is determination. I am sure many stories of painful strivings and overcoming great obstacles can be told from among you. You deserve to be honored. The pages of history are filled with striking examples of what determination can do. Cripple a man and you have a Sir Walter Scott. Bury him in the snow at Valley Forge and you have a George Washington. Have him born in abject poverty and you have an Abraham Lincoln. Put him in a grease pit in a locomotive roundhouse, and you have a Walter Chrysler. Make him a second fiddle in an obscure orchestra, and you have a Toscanini. We have reached graduation. We must now seek new worlds to conquer and keep the lamp of determination burning brightly. We are indebted to so many who have helped us along the way, teachers, advisors, family, and friends. I challenge you and me to become the best we can be, to continue to educate ourselves as we lower the buckets and drink from the opportunities that surround us. Let us not deny the humanity of others, but let us fill our individual worlds with enthusiasm and determination. May the horizons stretch before us. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker for the evening. Governor Norman Bangader was born in Granger, Utah. He attended Cypress High School, Brigham Young University, and the University of Utah. He is married to the former Colleen Monson, and they have six children, one foster child and nine grandchildren. A building contractor and a veteran of 25 years in Utah's real estate development industry, Norman Bangader is past president of NHB Construction. He has been a member of the Utah Technical College Advisory Board, the State Constitutional Revision Commission, and former chairman of the Advisory Board for LDS Social Services in Utah. He has also served on Utah's Job Training Council and is Utah chairman of the Apprenticeship Program for the Home Builders of America. Governor Bangader served in the Utah House of Representatives from 1974 to 1984, where he served as Speaker of the House, Majority Leader, and Assistant Majority Whip. In 1983, Governor Bangader was named as one of the top 10 legislators in America by the National Republican Party and was recognized by President Reagan for his legislative leadership. He's listed in Who's Who in Politics and Who's Who in the West, plus many, many other accomplishments. May I present to you our commencement speaker, the Honorable Norman Bangader, Governor of the State of Utah.
Thank you very much, President Carnahan, Commissioner Kerr, distinguished regents, the institutional council members, the faculty, parents, graduates, and all of you that are here this evening. It is a pleasure to be with you. As uh, Naomi talked about uh, learning, I thought about my father and some of the instructions that he used to give to me. He used to tell me that you're ever learning, Norman, but you're never coming to a knowledge of the truth. And sometimes that's the way we are. We learn a lot of things about a lot of different things, but we don't ever get down to the crux of the issue and really determine what we're going to do. I'd like to offer my congratulations to President Christensen and to Richard Lindsay for their uh, honorary degrees this evening. Very familiar with both of them. I've not only worked with Senator Christensen for many years as a builder and developer, uh, we've done a lot of business together over many years, but I've worked with him in government, and he is truly a man who uh, puts his heart and soul into uh, all of the endeavors that he undertakes. Uh, Richard Lindsay, of course, is even uh, close, more closely associated in that he married uh, one of my big sisters uh, some 35 or more years ago. I, I really am not sure how long, but at least 35. He doesn't look that old, does he? My sister was very young when he married her. <laughs> but it, uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here, particularly on a hot, dry, windy day. You know, I pray for hot, dry, windy days these days so that lake will go down and so that we won't have any storms. I'm a little tired of being introduced, and I appreciated it tonight, uh, not being introduced as the Admiral of the Fleet. That's uh, something that we've been talking about a great deal more. But I think that points out something. You know, we were called upon in life to make some difficult decisions. That clearly was a difficult decision. But sometimes it's up to you to make the decision. You made decisions to come to this institution for a purpose. And so the decision-making process of one is one which we all must learn and we all must continually use throughout our lives in many different endeavors. I remember my first experience with the Utah Technical College. My business partner of over 20 years, Marv Hendrickson, had been a student here. And when we determined in the Home Builders Association that we needed a, an apprenticeship training program, we met with our apprenticeship council on the, in the state. This was long before I got into the politi political arena. We met with the Technical College, and we set up a training program to teach people the building trades. And that was a great part of uh, this institution and has been. You come to us tonight as a group of people who have had multiple kinds of training. Some are receiving associate degrees, some certificates, some have been uh, in the school for many years, some only a few months. But you've all come to us with an objective in mind, and I'm hopeful that we've been able to meet the challenge that we face as a state of providing for each of you the opportunity that you will need as you progress through your lives and endeavor not only to expand your individual and private horizons, but to be able to, to find meaningful employment, support your family, and enjoy a great quality of life here in our state. I'm sure that you're all pleased to be receiving your degree or certificate. This evening marks the, ful marks the fulfillment of the work and time you've invested in this endeavor. Usually, especially on happy occasions such as this, we think of graduation as a time of finishing something. We even tend to say, at last that's over. Again, to quote my father, he used to always say to me, Norman, in all I getting, get going. And now you've completed this part of your training and it's time to get going onto another field of endeavor. Tonight I'd like to suggest a, a different view of graduation. One of the meanings of the word graduates is to, is to pass from one stage of experience, proficiency, or prestige to another, or hopefully a higher one. I believe in this area, era that definition is most accurate. No longer can we think of the com completion of one set of goals as the end of our goal making. Rather, I recommend thinking of your current success as the foundation for the next round of preparation and challenge. Ptolemy, the great, brilliant Greek astronomer and geographer said, everything that is hard to attain is easily assailed by the generality of men. He was right. Difficult goals such as obtaining college degrees are often the target for pot shots. It's easier to choose a course of least resistance than it is to constantly seek improvement. 
it is easier to criticize than to suggest positive solutions to problems. But in the long run, it is men and women who decide to graduate to new goals throughout their lives who experience the finest life has to offer. We might argue among ourselves what is the most distinguished degree one can attain. I made the determination many years ago that whatever you decide is your endeavor is the most important degree or achievement or training. And the thing that you have to remember that is most important is that if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. So whatever your training, whatever your vocation, whatever your profession, I hope that you feel proud of it and that you're committed to be the very best that you can be. I've spoken often during the administration about the quality of life in our beautiful state. I believe we enjoy opportunities here which surpass those opportunities anywhere in this world. I often tell my wife, Colleen, that I could enjoy a year just traveling through this beautiful state and drinking in, in a leisurely pace, the beauties and the qualities of life that we enjoy in Utah. Our quality of life continues to rise, and I am pleased with our progress. I am also concerned, however, when I see Utahns failing to live up to the opportunities that are around them. Recently, I visited the Utah community and talked with many of the people. I invited citizens to come and spend some time with me, telling me of their individual concerns and hopes. One young man came in complaining about the wages that he was making. I asked him what training he had had. He had none. Instead, I believe, of going to school, he had chosen to spend his time in other ways. What he wanted me to do was find a way that he could earn more money with doing less work. And we can't do that easily. We live in a difficult world. He was not prepared. And that's the worst thing that can happen to any of us, is to not be prepared because the opportunities are there. A lot of people look for such a solution. They falsely assume that living in a land of abundant opportunity guarantees equal abundance to all alike. Fortunately, you graduates enter the workforce at a time of fascinating change and development. The opportunities are greater than they have ever been, and I believe the creative, entrepreneurial minds in this graduating class will find ample challenge, challenges in many professional arenas. I am sure that you will also find more competition, more need for constantly honing your skills, and more change in industry than ever before. I am one who believes that all these things are positive. Some say American industry is dead, that we have been done in by foreign products and technology. I do not agree. I think in America we are reappraising and restructuring both our business and our thinking communities. We are an adaptive people, and we will be successful, but we'll only be successful if we set our priorities properly. I say this for two reasons. First, we are a free people, and I hope that you all understand the magnitude of that word freedom as we use it here in America. We can change. We can change our system because our system allows for change. Second, we clearly understand the link between economic growth and development and education. More than ever, we understand that without prepared people, we cannot progress, and without a strong economy, we cannot provide the training facilities we need. We are in an age of cooperation, and that is essential that the cooperation between business and education is constantly enhanced. We must set our public priorities. Education must, as has been said this evening, be at the top of that list. That will take commitment from the total community, but more importantly, I believe it will take commitment from each of you, from all of us that are here tonight. We have to determine that that is what is a priority. I like to tell the story that my father never bought a new car, and I thought that we were poor. He had lots of children. He just had his priorities different. He had set them in a different way, and a new car was the least of his priority priorities. And that's the way it should be with us. Your education should be the priority. A new automobile can come after an education and after other experiences, and it's important that we continually set those kinds of priorities. The President has talked about the business advisory groups here at UT UTC as an example of making that partnership stronger and more productive. And I commend them for their leadership in these programs and urge them to continue them. Much is made these days about new knowledge and its rapid proliferation. 
it is impossible to keep up with all that is going on as we rush towards the 21st century. I would like to suggest that as you set forth full-time into the working world, you keep in mind a second definition of graduation. The root word is also the same of, of that of the word graduation and gradual. Sometimes I fear we make too much of the need to push pell-mell into the future. I find great merit in the process of moving steadily and constantly through the gradations of knowledge and experience required to become more successful in our chosen profession. The literature of the day would have us think that by following a few simple rules, we can immediately reach the apex of our professional ambition. If we can add milk and instantly have breakfast or zap an entire meal in 30 seconds and get dinner ready, surely just as quickly we can have success. But unfortunately, or probably fortunately, it doesn't work that way. Mark Twain once quipped, Let us be thankful for fools, but for them the rest of us could not succeed. Sometimes I feel the truly foolish people are those who think they can easily attain great things. Success is success because it is hard to achieve. It is possible to achieve, however, and we must never lose sight of that. Tonight is the beginning of years of possibilities for you. You have prepared well at one of our finest institutions of higher education in our state. I am proud of the Utah Technical College of Salt Lake. On the campus of this school, we see how successfully a technical college can serve diverse needs. You are an example of that tonight. We also see how important technical training is for our present and our future. Life is filled with opportunity. It is filled with sacrifice. It's filled with commitment. It's filled with decision-making. Heber J. Grant used to say, and my uncle taught me this as a young boy, that which we persist in doing becomes easier, not that the nature of the thing has changed, but because our power to do has increased. Your pursuing your education has increased your ability. It's increased your horizons. And now you have to move on and get on with the job and make sure that as you graduate tonight, you'll view this graduation as yet another beginning. I hope you'll be patient as you grow in your professional skills, and I wish each of you the very best as you move forward into fulfilling the dreams that you've made for yourselves. Thank you very much.
Everything that's taken place up to now is to set the stage for what I'm sure you consider the most important part of this ceremony, the awarding of your certificates, degrees, and diplomas. It's been an interesting week this past week as we've attended the school's uh, recognition award banquets, and we've had an opportunity to talk to many of you graduates. The schools have taken particular effort to recognize all of the graduates in their programs and pay particular attention also to those who have achieved outstanding recognition. And for you parents, as you see some of the students come across with cords on, uh, those gold cords would be representative of presidential awards and the silver cords would be recognition of dean awards which have to do with scholastic achievement. But it was very, very interesting to talk to the graduates and their families as they came to these uh, ceremonies and to listen to the uh, stories they told about how and what they had to go through to get where they are tonight. I particularly recall one lady who had six or seven children and had taken six years at night coming to this program in order to graduate. That takes a lot of determination and a lot of effort on the part of her and her family and those others that supported them. And I'd like to caution you uh, graduates that you be mindful of the sacrifice of your mates, your parents, your children that have assisted you in arriving to where you are tonight. I heard one uh, young lady at the uh, senior or at the graduating uh, student luncheon today and said it'll be good to see some of the faculty and have a chance to say a last goodbye to all of them who helped us. May I challenge you to remember that the best thanks that you can give the faculty and in fact the college is by where you go and what you do from tonight on. Please keep us in mind. You in a very real sense are Utah Technical College and as you succeed, we succeed and that's our thanks. So let me challenge you to keep us in mind and keep us informed as to your successes because that's the best thanks we can receive. Now, President, it gives me a great deal of pleasure and honor on behalf of the faculty and staff to recommend these students to you. They have met all of the requirements necessary to receive their certificates, diplomas, and degrees. And it does give me a great pleasure to recommend them to you. Will you please stand? You have fulfilled all the requirements for your degree or certificate and have the recommendation of the college faculty that you be graduated. By virtue of the authority vested in the Board of Regents and the Institutional Council and delegated to me, I confer upon you your degree or certificate. The diplomas will now be presented. Will you please be seated until you're called forward to receive your diploma? Thank you.
School of Business and Industry, Associate of Science. Leon Brown. Nadine Somerville. Catherine E. Schaefer. Robert Wagner. Scott R. Rogers. Linda A. Brown. Brent W. Blackwell. Wesley T. Barlow. Division of Accounting and Data Processing and Finance and Credit, Accounting. James D. Lindell. Jeffrey L. Sperry. Krista Faltenbarger. Chris S. Copeland. Patrick M. Ingleby. Lynn A. Christensen. Jeffrey B. Young. Mohammed Talik. Mark L. Masters. David Barney. Jeffrey G. Mills. Guy W. Moss. Geraldine K. Deal. Kimberly Sackus. Margaret L. Rasba. Patricia A. Leff. Graduates, that round of applause is for you. Would you please stand? I think it would be entirely appropriate at this time for me to suggest to you that you give a round of applause to all of those who have supported you these many years. Thank you. Now for the toughest part of the ceremony for me. Two or three years ago at this point, I was asked to ask the graduates now to transfer the tassels from the left to the right. But as I faced the graduating class, it appeared to me that it should go from the right to the left. So as I made the announcement, I confused everybody. My colleagues up here are betting that I will make the same mistake again tonight. So to avoid that, you as graduates now are entitled to transfer the tassels to the other side. Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity that we have had 
of attending the Utah Technical College at Salt Lake for the knowledge and understanding that we have gained there. We're grateful for the faculty, staff, and administration who have helped us gain this knowledge. We ask you to bless us that as we continue on life's journey that we will use this knowledge in furthering our lives. Please bless us at all times. We say these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.